This film is based on a true story. A 20-year-old guy named Daniel, serving his sentence in prison, dreams of dedicating his life to serving God. A preacher father Tomash came to the prisoners and said that each person is equally important to Christ. Daniel listened with enthusiasm to the priest's speech, who asked him to sing. Daniel fulfilled the request, the other guys followed his example. During lunch, a new prisoner nicknamed Bonus, was brought into the dining room. It turned out that he knew Daniel and was going to get even with him. Bonus threw a plate of food at his cellmate, but the warden stopped the fight. Before sleeping, Daniel prayed in his cell, believing that God would help him find redemption for his sin. Just in case, Father Tomash left his phone number with Daniel, who will soon be released. The guy wants to serve God more than anything, but the priest said that no seminary would accept a criminal, even if he scored the highest grade on the exam. Of course, Daniel was upset. The priest who helped him find a job said he had to be sober. On the first day of his release, Daniel got drunk and committed all sorts of sins. Daniel had fun all night, but the next morning he felt very bad because of the hangover. On the bus, one passenger didn't like that he was smoking. Daniel refused to throw away the cigarette, and the passenger showed him his police ID. The man immediately realized that Daniel had recently been released from prison. He arrived at the sawmill where he was supposed to work. Looking at the workers, the guy realized that he too would have to do hard physical labor. On the memorial stand in town, Daniel noticed many pictures of different people. First thing, Daniel went to the church. A girl told him that the next service would only be in the morning. The guy lied that he was a priest. Of course, the girl didn't believe him. To prove his words, Daniel showed the girl a clergyman's robes he had bought in advance. Martha immediately became serious and called a woman who brought the guy to the vestry, asking him to change his clothes. Realizing that his lie had gone too far, Daniel tried to escape, but the window was locked. Soon Lydia introduced him to the local pastor, Father Golub. Daniel lied that his name was Father Tomash. He supposedly engaged in pilgrimages and moved from place to place. When Golub asked Daniel which seminary he had attended, the guy answered the first thing that came to his mind, and then changed the subject, asking about the pictures on the memorial stand. The priest only replied that there had been a recent tragedy in their town and offered Daniel to stay at his house for the night. During the night, Daniel stole some money and went to a 24-hour store to buy cigarettes. He was noticed by Martha, the priest's daughter. Many people were praying at the memorial stand. When Daniel returned to the house, Father Tomash called him, but the guy didn't answer the phone. In the morning, he saw Golub lying on the floor next to the bed. It turns out that the Holy Father despite his poor health, abuses alcohol. Golub was now unable to conduct the confession, so his wife Lydia asked Daniel to replace him. As Daniel had no appropriate knowledge, he googled a confessor's guide. A woman who talked about difficult relationship with her son did not expect such straightforward answers from the priest. During the day, Daniel returned to Golub's house. The Holy Father, who looked thoughtful, admitted that he had committed a grave sin once. He confessed, but it doesn't change anything. Now Golub is looking for someone who could replace him while he is being treated for alcoholism. In Golub's opinion, Daniel is the perfect candidate for the role of the local priest. Daniel was at a loss, as he would now have to conduct masses, but he knows nothing about it. Daniel was assigned a shabby house. At night, he read a worship book to gain some knowledge. At 8 in the morning, there was a mass attended by quite a few people. Daniel hardly knew the words of the liturgy, so he improvised, saying that silence could also be a prayer. The new priest's speech touched the parishioners to the depths of their souls. When Daniel sang the same way he did in prison, the parishioners began to sing along feeling the sincerity emanating from the priest. In the evening returning home, Daniel noticed someone at the memorial stand. Seeing the priest, the stranger immediately ran away. The next day, Daniel visited Golub's house. Martha was there too. Daniel noticed the exact same photo as on the memorial stand. Martha told him about the tragedy that shook their small town. It turned out that seven people died in the accident, including Cuba, Martha's brother. Daniel was surprised that there were only six photos on the plaque. Lydia said that the priest prohibited putting up a photo of the driver of the second car, whom everyone considered to be responsible for the accident. After the conversation about the tragedy, Martha couldn't calm down for a long time. That evening, Daniel joined the people who prayed at the memorial stand. The guy, who had learned the names of the dead beforehand, addressed God, asking him not to condemn all those who are now angry with the Almighty. 
According to the Daniel, each of these people had lost loved ones and had a right to be angry. Daniel continued to preach in the church, but he didn't read prayers, he improvised. The parishioners really liked his sincere speeches. Later, Lydia told Daniel that the treatment of Father Golub was delayed, so he would have to stay here for some time. At night, someone knocked on Daniel's door. Lydia came for the priest and took him to one of the houses where a family with children lived. Daniel had to perform the prayer over the dying. He took the hand of the elderly woman who had a few minutes left to live. At that moment, she passed away right in front of him. Daniel felt his hands shaking. At home, he tried to regain his composure for a long time. During the day, Daniel again read sermons at the memorial stand. The people, feeling the sincerity of the priest, fully trusted him. Martha and her friend noticed this. The priest's approach to work was very unconventional, but perhaps that's what helped all these people get through their grief. Once, Mayor Wakiwicks came to Daniel's house to meet the new priest. He didn't expect the priest to be a young man. It turned out that the sawmill belonged to the mayor. He planned to open a new wing at Easter and wanted the pastor to publicly consecrate this place. Later, Martha introduced Daniel to her friends. He easily found common ground with the young men. The conversation turned to that tragedy. Everyone believes that the driver of the second car is to blame, as he was allegedly drunk at the time of the accident. It turned out that Father Golub even forbade him from being buried in the local cemetery. Martha was not present at the funeral, and her friends reproach her for it. The tragedy happened a year ago, but the townspeople are still unable to recover from it. Despite being a clergyman, Daniel did not hesitate to drink and smoke. Soon he and Martha came to the grave of Cuba. Martha admitted that she did not come to her brother's funeral because she got drunk out of grief. According to the girl, the woman whose husband was blamed for the accident has not left her home or spoken to anyone for a year. Daniel visited her at home, but Ava Kobielski reacted hysterically. All the townspeople hate her. Once, the mayor asked the Holy Father not to mention that tragedy anymore, as people had only just started to recover from their grief. Daniel said that he had the right to talk to parishioners about anything, then the mayor hinted to the priest that he could ruin his reputation. On Easter, the mayor gave a speech in honor of the opening of his new sawmill and asked Father Tomash to bless it. Daniel knelt down, and the rest of the people followed his example. The priest made a speech about human greed and thirst for power. The mayor immediately understood that these words were addressed to him. When everyone entered the sawmill building, Daniel was horrified to see his former cellmate. The priest hurriedly left on false pretenses. Daniel doesn't know what to do now, as his legend could crumble at any moment. Despite the mayor's ban, he asked the people to bring items that reminded them of their loved ones who they lost in this tragedy. Martha brought her brother's cap. Daniel said that he would take all these things to the orphanage. Martha showed the priest a video that Cuba sent her three hours before the incident. It turned out that the young people were very drunk, but the forensic examination did not show this. It turns out that someone was interested in hiding the truth. Daniel and Martha came to the widow's house so that she too could give some memorabilia. Surprisingly, Ava let them into the house and gave the priest letters with threats from the townspeople. Everyone believed that Ava was also to blame because she allowed her husband to drive while drunk. But Ava assured that her husband had not drunk for four years and that the results of the forensic examination were falsified. Among Ava's letters, Martha recognized her mother's handwriting. It turned out that the ashes of Ava's husband were still kept in the house. Golub never allowed him to be buried. One day Daniel's former cellmate Pinkser came to confess. He knew that Daniel had led an immoral life in the past. For his silence, Pinkser wants 5,000. Daniel doesn't have that kind of money, but he has no choice either. If he goes back to prison, it's the end for him. Daniel thinks about what to do now and prays. During Mass, he collects donations from parishioners. Pinkser watches it carefully. After that, Daniel gave a speech, saying that he was sinful like everyone else. The holiday came, and all the townspeople gathered. After the prayer, people celebrated, and Martha sang a song on stage to honor the memory of those who deceased in the terrible tragedy. Then Daniel took the stage, announcing that all the money collected at today's service would go towards burying the driver who still hasn't been laid to rest. At night, Pinkser came to Daniel's house and demanded the money. However, seeing the expensive TV, Pinkser agreed to take it instead of the money. The guys got drunk. Pinkser didn't expect to hear that during sermons, Daniel improvises instead of learning from the internet. 
Pinkser envies his former cellmate, who has an innate talent for leading people. Remembering his daughter, Pinkser burst into tears. He understands that he won't be able to take care of his child. Almost all the people in the town are outraged by the priest's decision and intend to prevent it. Then Martha pulled out the threatening letters and handed them out to the senders, including her mother. After slapping her daughter, Lydia left. Martha also left, angered by the hypocrisy of all these people. At night, local guys blocked Daniel's way, making it clear that if he continued to insist on the driver's funeral, it would end badly. The guy did not expect the priest to knock him out. Martha asked for permission to stay at his house. Daniel made her a bed, but the girl clearly expected something else. Suddenly she kissed him, and passion arose between them. At some point they noticed a fire from the window. It was clear that the arson was set by disgruntled townspeople. In the morning, a senior lieutenant arrived. The priest's face seemed familiar to him. Daniel said they had definitely not met because he supposedly was from Warsaw. The mayor suggests that everyone come to a compromise and bury the driver in his hometown, but at the same time hang his photo on the memorial stand. Lydia is categorically against it. And Daniel continues to insist that the man should be buried here. The priest wanted to tell the truth about Cuba and the rest, but Martha hinted that he shouldn't. Ava asked the pastor for a private conversation, admitting that the night before the accident, she had a fight with her husband. The man threatened that if his wife didn't open the door, he would do something desperate. Ava still didn't open the door for him. Soon the driver's funeral took place. When the procession passed by the mayor's house, he realized that the priest had won. Of course, Lydia didn't go to the funeral. Grief over the loss of her son prevented her from thinking rationally. Seeing Daniel in the vestments of a priest, the real father Tomash who had just arrived in town, was puzzled. The driver was finally buried. Daniel invited everyone to a farewell service at the church. Tomash took Daniel home, demanding an explanation. The guy guessed that Pinkser had betrayed him. Martha came in, sensing that something was wrong. Tomash lied that he had come on behalf of the bishop to take Daniel to the Curia. When Martha asked if Father Tomash would return to them, the real Tomash was confused. He certainly did not expect to find out that the guy had been using his name all this time. Despite Tomash's orders, Daniel intends to conduct the farewell service. Tomash came to the vestry and attacked the guy, calling him a fool. Daniel only said that he had not harmed anyone. Tomash does not understand why none of the residents guessed that Daniel is not a priest. Tomash intended to conduct the service himself. As agreed, Daniel went out to the parishioners to introduce him. After this, he will have to pack his things and wait for Tomash. Suddenly in front of the parishioners, Daniel took off his priestly robes to show everyone the tattoos on his body. After that, he silently left the church. Daniel is back in prison, like Pinkser. Father Golub returned to his duties as a priest. For the first time this year, Ava dared to come to church. Martha decided to leave this town.